Alex, are people coming into the room? Yep, we have some attendees joining. Um, hi everyone, just to let you know, we will be getting started in a few moments, um, just as we let everyone uh, join the webinar, but thank you for attending. Hello to everybody that's joining us. Just give us one more minute and we will get started. We're just trying to get everybody into the session and out of the waiting room, but we're happy that you're here and we look forward to a great cafe session. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third and final Cultural Access Forum and Exchange of Spring 2021. We're really excited to have you with us. My name is Charlie Miller. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at ArtReach. I use the pronouns he, his. And a quick verbal description of myself. I am a white male in my 40s with dark hair, a pretty decent beard on me, and I'm sitting in a gray recliner. We wanted to do a quick land acknowledgement. The staff and the offices of ArtReach sit on the ancestral land of the Lenape Indigenous Native American tribe. In Art Re at ArtReach, we create, advocate for, and expand accessible opportunities so the full spectrum of society is served. We are joined today with a card captioner provided by Caption Access. To view captions, select the CC icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We'll also put a link in the chat, which will take you to an additional browser for web link capability. We are also joined by Megan from Hands Up Productions, who is our ASL interpreter for today's cafe. Should you wish to ask a question during the question and answer portion of today's webinar, you may use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can also click the raise your hand button in your lower screen and we can unmute you to voice your question. Please use that chat for tech or accessibility questions. The session is being recorded and we will post it on YouTube later. The first person that's going to start us off with our cafe session today is Barbara Wong. She is a local um, colleague of uh, ArtReach here in Philadelphia. She's the Director of Community Engagement at the Barnes Foundation, and we are super excited to have her start off our session. Barbara, if you'd like to uh, start your video, unmute yourself and begin sharing your screen. We're excited to hear what you have to say. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Philadelphia. Um, I'd like to just start off with um, identifying myself as she, her, and just um, as Charlie started a quick verbal description of myself, I am uh, an Asian woman and I have rapidly graying hair, uh, especially over this past year and a half. Um, and uh, I am 
located in a very empty room right now, but very soft hues of kind of like bluish gray with a little bit of a light glow from my desk lamp. So uh, welcome you to my own environment um, as I share with you our work at the Barnes. Share my screen. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to some of our work um, that we've actually explored as a result of the global pandemic and creating hybrid opportunities um, in order to be able to continue to reach and serve our communities and reaching them at home. Um, if you are not aware, the Barnes is located in Philadelphia on the Museum Parkway on Benjamin Franklin Parkway, where there is quite a cluster of cultural institutions. Um, and it's a relatively new um, facility on the parkway, and it moved from um, a community in Marion. But we found over time that um, wanting to continue to serve the mission of the Barnes and Dr. Barnes' goal of art for everyone, the idea of coming to Philadelphia and serving more communities um, led us to sort of come to Philadelphia on the parkway. But what we realized within the first five years that we were continuing to serve the same demographic and we're really looking to be able to serve our communities at large in Philadelphia, particularly those who have been underserved or underrepresented at many of our cultural institutions. To start off, I'm going to give you a little bit of context in terms of where we are now, in terms of some of the things we've discovered and opportunities in terms of programming and moving forward. But to give you some context of where we were, um, our offsite program map shows that a lot of our work has been spread across the city, focusing primarily on some anchor programs and partnerships. Puente Salas Artes is a partnership with a health clinic in South Philadelphia, serving a primarily Latinx community, which is a very much growing population and immigrant population that has really been underserved and underrepresented within our institution. Barnes at Lola 38, or now called Barnes West, is a partnership with the People's Emergency Center, which is a program that serves um, a transitional population around social services and care, housing, and um, also with community development uh, within the neighborhoods and within specific neighborhoods in West Philadelphia. Our virtual reality project has been citywide in, in terms of reaching out to communities um, that have not had the opportunity to be able to benefit from coming to our institution on the parkway and it's taking virtual reality goggles out into communities through neighborhood partnerships. And then our summer imaginarium camps, which have been uh, focused on partnerships with parks and rec centers throughout the city so that we can engage youth um, at an early age in terms of connecting to art and opportunities that our institutions can offer. Our on-site work has focused around a lot of fi family engagement because that's where we recognize a lot of our community interests are in terms of family programming. We've uh, or organized uh, stroller tours, toddler time, Pico free for Sundays, and bilingual family tours for language access. Our summer Imaginarium site, as I mentioned before, it engages the kids where they are at the rec centers, bringing them into a connection with our community engagement and education team um, at the rec centers and uh, having sustainable relationships with them over a six week period. And then we engage with visits to the barns where they continue to connect with their educators in the gallery site so that they have authentic experiences with art both art making as well as art enrichment and appreciation within gallery setting. As I mentioned before, our virtual reality project starts with taking place reaching communities where they are in very um, localized sites in partnership with organizations like the free libraries, with community centers, with senior centers, housing complexes, um, and also with parks and rec centers. So we begin with our engagement within communities over a few sessions 
um, developing those relationships and trusting relationships with our connectors and our educators. And then the same connectors and educators uh, facilitate tailored custom tours at the barns, um, chaperoning our guests um, uh, using our uh, provided transportation so that they have transportation access to the barns as well. And then we continue to develop relationships with um, our access cards, our community passes. So now I'm going to transition, uh, as, as many of us, COVID has um, asked us or demanded of us to think about our programming a little bit differently in terms of how we connect with our communities and continue to sustain the relationships with our residents in our communities and continue to build that connection to the barns and our collection and to art. As an example of how we've transitioned our partnership with Puentes de Artes, you can see um, just little um, pictures of what our programming has looked like. We um, did on-site programming within a local community school, the South Fork Community School, bringing our teaching artists um, and programming out um, on two times a week within the community school, working with closely with families as well as little ones between ages um, three to five, which is essentially the pre-K program, but it also includes a lot of family strengthening. So we have a team uh, going out to the schools. We also connect with family workshops at the barns, providing again, transportation guided tours so that families have opportunities to develop skills to connect uh, using uh, our cultural institutions as family resources where it's a place that they feel welcome and can go and as well as learning strategies on how to observe art, talk about art, and make those relevant connections and build language skills with their children. Um, this is a biliteracy project where we're teaching both in English and in Spanish so that um, our children are developing strengths in both their languages, their native language or home language, as well as in English as they prepare for entry into school. In our hybrid approach, we um, uh, had to assess essentially and reflect in terms of strength, some of the strengths of the program. This program is now about three and a half or four years old. We just had our graduation last week. Um, and so what we came across as a team, we identified the things that we had been doing really well. And one of the, one of the piece, the things that we highlighted was connection to art and connection to the collection of the barns as a resource for developing language and vocabulary. Um, art making, uh, having direct art making opportunities so that kids can connect um, with using their, their critical thinking and hands and working with materials and making, providing opportunities in terms of connection with books around particular themes that we're presenting through our artwork, and also bringing people together, which is having a community of our children, but also our children and their parents and caregivers and siblings as well. So this resulted in a Zoom class where we used Power Zoom as well to enter into the galleries and could focus on specific works of art. Love for their teaching artist on a regular basis. Um, and then having materials in hand in terms of books and art supplies, and then having that constant communication and relationship building through group Zooms so that everybody could see each other as part of a community on a regular basis. Our next project, Barnes at Lola 38 or Barnes West in partnership with the People's Emergency Center, our programming was multifaceted in terms of family workshops, youth activities, panelists with local resident artists within West Philadelphia and connecting them to exhibitions and panelists or presenters and educators from the barns, as well as on-site visits to the barns for gallery exhibitions, visits to the collection and to our free first Sunday programming. With the onset of, pro of COVID as well, it forced us to recognize what are the strengths of the programs and how do we want to see this transition into um, hybrid opportunities where we can maintain a connection to our communities. 
um, this year, this this week, as as you are all probably well aware, is the anniversary of the um, the death of George Floyd. Not only did COVID and the quarantine result in a huge impact in our underserved communities, but also there was so much around the social um, unrest that resulted um, as a result of the um, the George Floyd killing. So it raised a lot of um, anxiety and stress and concern and, and just the isolation compounded within our communities was really hard hit. And so um, what we wanted to do is try to bring back a sense of hope and light through the Lantern Project, um, the Lantern in Place Project with Juneteenth program, we created art kits that would go out to residents within the community distributed through food pantries. Um, we had a community block captains coming to um, residents and with porches and provided Zoom trainings uh, as well in engaging people in connecting with making lanterns to shed light and hope and also messages of peace uh, for the community. With the Barnes at Lola 38 and Barnes West project as well, we wanted to continue to find ways to bring our communities together, both through the virtual lens. Um, using Zoom, we had a film club night um, similar to the model of a book club, we created a, a film critics night where we could engage with local filmmakers in West Philly, as well as um, connect to um, public programming conversations with our education team and then having a Zoom, the Zoom conversations. The summer programming resulted in a distribution of 1150 art kits that were distributed through food distribution sites, as well as through parks and rec centers and our partners. This was really in response to our sense that we wanted to help families um, um, who didn't have access to art supplies or materials in hand to keep their children um, uh, engaged or provide opportunities while everyone was in self-quarantine. Um, we recognized through a lot of our conversations with our partners and communities that children especially were experiencing a lot of emotional stress during these times and didn't have materials to be able to really um, express themselves and to be able to create. So we wanted to highlight um, and emphasize the opportunity to bring materials out to our kids and families. The Barnes also um, wanted to create, we created some structure in terms of some of our programming for um, families at home. So we introduced um, family art activity sheets that were distributed through the art kits, but also available online, making it available to a broad stretch of our families and communities. Um, this also was for the first time for the Barnes, recognizing that we needed to address language access in our communities as well. So we now have um, on our website the ability to click onto these family art time activity sheets in English as well as in Spanish. And what these um, art activity sheets are, it introduces children and families to um, work within our program, I mean, in our collection, but also a creative project that will utilize materials that families would naturally just have at home, that they didn't have to have special art materials to be able to create this work. Barnes lessons being learned through this process is relationship building through interactive exchange, access to materials, balanced use of digital technology and human interface, accessibility and inclusion of those that are under-resourced and underrepresented, bringing back joy, hope, and healing throughout all of our, um, throughout all of our programming, being nimble, innovative, and adaptive mindset for our programming, and continuing to foster strong partnerships. And that's all I have to show you. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. You just, you took like a whole pandemic year 
<laughs> condense it down into 15 minutes. I'm in awe of you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I feel like I just got off a roller coaster, a good roller coaster. <laughs> and, I like and I have to confess, I did not have a chance to rehearse a lot of that. So I'm really glad I was able to present it. No, no, no. I hope, I hope no, it was there. <laughs> it was good. Your pacing was great. Well, <laughs> I'm tired for you. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, next up, uh, we want to welcome uh, to the screen Amber Carroll. She's the director of Covia Well Connected. So Amber, if you want to um, turn your mic on and start your video and share your screen, we're excited to welcome you as our second presenter. I should have unmuted first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Give me just a second here. All right. Uh, slide share from beginning. OK, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Amber Carroll. I am the Senior Director of Connection Programs at Covia. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm joining you from a place where I wish we had all those messages of hope that Barbara talked about. I'm joining you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, where all the action uh, seems to have gone down. So, um, so thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to share uh, some options for staying connected. Whereas Barbara was talking about staying uh, families and children, I'm gonna focus my attention more on older adults. Uh, I'm part of an organization called Covia, now an affiliate of Front Porch. And we predominantly play in the arena of senior housing, but we do have a whole division of community services. And what I'm gonna talk about today are some of those things that are accessible to folks both online and on phone. So um, I was asked to talk about Well Connected and Social Call, which is are what we consider to be our connection programs. But if we do have time, I'd like to touch on a few other opportunities as well. So these programs with Covia are the Well Connected programs, Social Call, Ruth's Table, Creative Spark, and the Creative Aging Symposium. So I'm gonna start with Well Connected. Uh, this is actually encompasses two programs, Well Connected and Well Connected Espanol. And these are virtual participant and volunteer opportunities for older adults that live anywhere within the United States. Everything we do in the Well Connected programs is by and for older adults. And we consider an older adult to be 60 and older. We are accessible and we're gonna talk more about that or I should say we are trying to be accessible. Um, but the biggest piece for this kind of goes to that offline connection piece is everything we do is accessible by phone or online. And everything we do is free of charge to individual participants. So let me dive into this more. I realize I just used the word accessible and now I'm showing a slide that is profoundly inaccessible. So I apologize for that. Um, but if you are seeing this screen, um, let me just share a few points about it. Um, this is a week in the life of the well-connected programs. And a couple things I wanna point out are one, it's a seven day a week calendar. Now this is important because I mentioned that we are a program by and for older adults. So one of the things we learned in talking to older adults was that weekends can be boring. And, um, and that's if folks are living in a senior living community or if they're, uh, they engage in senior centers or other activities that are often closed and just not many activities going on. So you can see that on Saturdays and Sundays, we have pretty rich offerings of things to do. Now, I hope you guys are hearing the enthusiasm in my voice. I love my job. That being said, I don't love working seven days a week and nor does the team. So how do we get all these programs every day of, every, uh, every day of the week? 
And I should also note that this is 365 days a year. So the way we do that is because we're leveraging the older adults in our program to not only participate, but to also volunteer. So we're leveraging that time and the passion and the skill and all kinds of interest for folks to share and give back to others. So about 70% of everything that you're seeing on this screen is led by our older adult community, most of whom are participants as well in the program. The other thing is this is color coded. So the groups in blue are the English program and the groups in orange are the, are the Spanish program. And you'll also notice that some of these groups are highlighted. Now, the bulk of Well Connected is really not just about content. It's really about people engaging with each other. They're connecting and engaging in small groups. Now, the groups that you see highlighted, those are what we consider to be our lifelong learning series. And because all of you on this call are really into the art world and all that creative, great stuff, I want to point out kind of a few things. Um, these are groups that we actually sell to other organizations for subscriptions to engage in group activities. So I can point those out to you. Uh, we've got armchair travel. Um, we get volunteers to take us all around the world on trips with them and share pictures. Uh, that's available in English and Spanish. Health and wellness. We bring in experts to talk about all kinds of topics related to health and wellness. Museums at home, my personal favorite, also available in English and in Spanish. Um, and then in English, we also have open studios and tech and culture. And for any Spanish speaking folks, on Saturday, this Saturday, we're hosting the second annual uh, Alzheimer's Association International Symposium. Last year, we got uh, visitors from 27 different countries joining that. So these are options that are available to individuals and they're also available to groups. Uh, the world is really our oyster when it comes to programming. It can be about absolutely anything you can think of. Um, we sort of believe that if you can do it, if you can do it live, you can do it, uh, you can do it in uh, virtually as well. So I just wanted to point out again, specific to this audience, my very favorite group is Museums at Home. And this is a group where we partner with museums all around the country to do docent tours for us. And um, and one of the things I just want to point out, I mean, my goodness, I'm speaking here with Art Justice and with the Barnes Foundation. My goodness, we'd love to add these uh, as partners for our programming. And these groups have visuals associated with them. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like for the actual program. But just as an example, uh, the de Young Museum in San Francisco was ready to launch the Frida Kahlo show and then the pandemic hit. So the show never opened. So actually that whole exhibit premiered on Well Connected, which was a really special thing. So for those of you who aren't gonna jump on a plane to go to an exhibit at any of these museums, you can join them from the comfort of your home and be taken through not only uh, current exhibits, but also uh, general exhibits, or in some cases we have uh, docents who curate their own special exhibits just for this group. Now, Steve Ballmer was the CEO of uh, Microsoft, and he had this wonderful quote that accessibility is all about removing barriers and providing the benefits of technology for everyone. Now, that's a lovely quote. I love it. Microsoft has a long way to go in this regard, uh, as do we, but we are making those efforts. So I wanna talk a little bit about this because as I mentioned, these programs are specifically for older adults. Now, if we're lucky enough to continue to stay on this planet, things might likely happen to us that might affect our mobility or our vision or our hearing or our brains. These things can happen. And as much as I'm working on sort of getting rid of those internalized isms and trying to look at aging as such a positive and creative life experience, these things can also happen and there can be some losses. So it's really important for us as a program being by and for older adults to pay attention to these things 
and make our program really accessible to everybody. So we've been working on this since our inception in 2004. And here are some things we've got going to address accessibility needs at this point in time. First and foremost, everything we do is accessible by phone or online. When I started in Well Connected close to six years ago, 18% of our entire population had online access. Now that's increasing rapidly. At this point in time though, we're still at only 48%, which leaves 52% of our population of older adults who don't have online access for any number of reasons. So it's really important for us to maintain that access for folks who have a phone. And it doesn't have to be a smartphone. It can be that avocado green telephone hanging on your kitchen wall. Um, we can call people into groups. We've actually been building out our own conferencing platform to address these issues that off the shelf conferencing solutions don't meet. So we can call people into groups. It's an automated process. We register our participants. So when people are called in, their name is going to be used. So Charlie, if you wanted to join book club, you'd get a call at the start of the group and it would say, hi, Charlie, welcome to book club and you'd be there. We are a national program. So all of our materials are available in the six time zones used throughout the United States. So we're gonna send you materials in the time zone you live in. For folks who are calling into our groups by phone, we have a two digit conference code. So it's a toll free number and a two digit conference code. I'm not sure if anyone's calling into this group, but you have to punch in something like 28 digits to get into a Zoom call. So ours, we wanted to keep really simple for folks wanting to call in themselves. For those who wanna join online, we're gonna send a personalized email on the morning of every group. So in the morning, you're gonna see that email, you'll click on the link and you'll be in the group at the time it starts. Also, we got funding a couple of years ago to start the Espanol program. And that was another key reason we started building our own technology. Not one of the conferencing platforms offered their services entirely in another language. So our Spanish program, everything that people are hearing or seeing on the screen is entirely in Spanish. Um, for folks who, have, who are low vision or blind, everything we have is available in large print. We have audio versions of our materials that can be plugged into talking book readers and our materials are available in braille for our braille readers. And I mentioned that Museums at Home program, that and our other lifelong learning programs and a few other programs have visuals associated with them. So for Museums at Home, we're actually looking at an exhibit. So the people who are joining us online are doing exactly what you're doing right now in watching the slides. But for the people joining us from home, we mail those handouts to people ahead of time. So while they're at home on the phone, they can follow along with what's going on on, on the screen. Um, I should also note that we train all of our facilitators really around speaking to an audience who's low vision and blind. So, um, so nothing gets missed in translation. And most of our groups are really about uh, that auditory piece. Now, as I say that, we are still lacking in a lot of accessibility areas. And so some of the things that we have in process and we're trying to raise money to build these out as we speak, or we wanna build in closed captioning um, for our online users to have access to that. We're trying to make this technology all screen reader friendly for folks. Um, we're building a, an online user portal. As I'm watching Megan here do the ASL interpretation, we would love to build that out. I have this whole other category when I say that we're buying for older adults, it's really about getting that input from, from people. So we wanna stay nimble as a program to address those needs as they arise. Um, I just wanna quickly touch on Gene Cohen, who some of you may have heard of, he's known as the father of creative aging and well connected in the other programs I'll hopefully be able to tell you about are really grounded in these two lenses that we look 
we look through these two lenses for everything we do. And one of them is accessibility and the other one is creative aging. And Jean Cohen put together this idea of a social portfolio, which is really similar to a financial portfolio with that idea that you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket because, oh my goodness, the market crashes and you've lost everything. Um, same idea for our socialization. So you're all here today learning about options. And it's this idea that Jean Cohen talks about that at some point in our lives, we might lose sight of one of these things. Um, we might fall, we might hurt ourselves, we might not be able to do that Zumba class or whatever it was. So we want to make sure we have plenty of social opportunity to keep ourselves healthy socially. So he breaks it down into quadrants of high and low energy activities that you do in groups and that you do as an individual. So listening to Barbara talk, I mean, a high energy group effort might be one of those amazing tours at the Barnes Foundation. Um, an individual effort, and we're gonna hear Art Justice, and I hope I'm getting this right, but an art kit that Art Justice sends that you might do alone would be an individual high energy effort. For low energy, maybe you're joining the Poetically Speaking group on Well Connected, or as an individual, you might just like curl up by the fire and read a new book. So with that, I wanna share with you some of these other creative virtual engagement opportunities that we have available through COVIA. Um, our sister program and the connection program is Social Call. And Social Call is a virtual friendly visiting program. So whereas Well Connected connects an individual to a group, Social Call connects an individual to an individual. And I see that I am about out of time. So I'm gonna fly through. Um, Ruth's table is a gallery space in San Francisco that I never talk about in national, uh, to a national audience, but COVID made that available to people to join, uh, to join these virtual spaces. So uh, this gallery is available virtually now and there's an amazing exhibit called Less is More, Making the Case for Minimalism that you are welcome to join. Um, Creative Spark is a program really more for professionals in the field, and we offer uh, consultation and training for professionals to really be more intentional about art programming and what they're doing. And then lastly, uh, the Creative Aging Symposium, which we host in partnership, Well Connected, Well Connected Espanol and Creative Spark. And we bring in leading experts in the creative aging world. Um, and we host that every January. So more information and here is the link um, to join you. And then uh, this is a quote from a participant and facilitator, which I will pass, but I'll end on just connection um, information if you want more information. And wow, I talked fast. So I apologize for that, but I wanted to make sure I got through all of that. So thank you. Breathe. <laughs> thank you, Amber. Um, and thank you for introducing us to everything that is going on on the West Coast. You know, we try to, we try not to, um, do the East Coast, West Coast, <laughs> um, you know, rivalry thing. And um, our deputy director actually um, finished her master's in San Francisco. So she knows a lot of um, what's going on in the museum world over there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, and we'll get your um, your contact information and whatnot in the chat if people wanna follow up with you. Wonderful, Thanks. wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so. Um, next up, uh, we are super excited to have two people from the University of British Columbia, um, Helen Brown and Kelsey Timler, and um, they are coming to talk to us about a really amazing program that our reach just found out about recently called Art Justice, and we are super excited to have you two joining us. So unmute and um, turn on your video screens, and if you want to start sharing, we are excited to hear what you have to say. Wonderful. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, I'm going to just start by describing myself. My name is Kelsey Timler. I'm a white woman in her early 30s wearing a white and blue striped sweater, and you can see the, the windy trees behind me in my apartment in Vancouver, Canada. I'll hand it over to Helen now. Thank you, Kelsey. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. 
um, from the west coast of Canada and British Columbia, and uh, we're thrilled and, and so grateful that uh, Katie found us uh, north of the border and invited us here today. Um, so my name is Helen Brown. I'm an associate professor in the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, which um, is the land of the unceded and stolen and occupied territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Squamish, Musqueam and tsleil nations. And I, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am uh, somewhere in my 50s <laughs> and white settler, researcher, academic nurse. Um, and I am sitting in the office I've been sitting in for most of this year. So I say the walls seem to be getting smaller, but uh, today with such a broad group across um, in the US, it feels like the walls are getting bigger. I have a picture behind me of a whale tail, which is symbolic of the Pacific Northwest and the beautiful um, creatures that inhabit our waters. I'm wearing a red sweater with indigenous designs on it with abalone buttons that was gifted to me by um, an amazing indigenous woman in northern um, BC who I carry with me in all of this work. So I bring greetings from, from the lands of the Coast Salish people. And I'll begin by telling you about our justice. Next slide. Please, Kelsey. Thank you. Um, also to say, when I'm using the term Indigenous in the Canadian context, it's a Canadian government policy um, category for speaking about the peoples of the land in which um, the colonial inhabitants displaced. And we have ongoing issues with colonialism in Canada. And I'm referring to First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples of Canada when I'm using that term. So um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the beginnings of art justice and it's a short backstory, but it spans about uh, six or seven years. Uh, so prior to the pandemic, we as researchers were working with federal corrections and we were studying an initiative called work to give where um, incarcerated peoples were making beautiful items from furniture to cultural items to star blankets and art and gifting them to Indigenous communities in British Columbia. And so what you're looking at here is the image of um, an amazing Indigenous artist holding a pink rocking horse that was made with inside the prison walls and gifted to the communities in British Columbia that were in part of this partnership project. And on the right is this amazing um, Indigenous woman who received in her horse trailer all of these amazing artistic and household items and cultural items and distributed those uh, to communities. And the most beautiful thing about this relationship, if you can imagine these two pictures together, is that the project really started to inspire this connection between incarcerated Indigenous peoples and communities and developed this reciprocity and relationship that supported both the well-being of the men and also the well-being, social well-being and economic well-being of the communities. And so for today, the, the backstory of this, of this project, Art Justice, is important because of the connectivity that the making and gifting and receiving of items created for relationships amongst these, um, these communities of people who are incarcerated and the communities receiving the items. And apropos for today's theme is, is talking about the importance of connectivity during COVID and isolation and digital connections for people who are highly overrepresented in the prison population, being Indigenous peoples in Canada, yet underrepresented in the Canadian context. So moving to the next slide here, um, in a, just over, well, about 15 months ago, um, as we all know, uh, COVID changed the world and essentially closed the gates uh, to research, programming and visitation and elder support for incarcerated peoples. And so the pre-existing conditions of isolation and dis disconnection were exacerbated through increased human rights violations and uh, additional social exclusion for incarcerated peoples. And so with those increased mental health harms, surveillance and a failure to implement public health restrictions and the uh, exacerbated harms that were um, were in place during those early months, we took the early learnings about work to give and brought those to the project we're going to share with you today. And so the image here is that um, we have a, a cartoon of how COVID turns any sentence into a death sentence juxtaposed against the already um, challenging, isolating and dehumanizing conditions within the prison walls. And so next slide, please. 
Um, so at this time, as researchers, we were studying an intervention that we knew was making a difference to Indigenous peoples and artists and communities. And we felt compelled to take the funding that we had to do research and do something that would support the communities and the men uh, that we had been working with. So we, we undertook sort of a um, we began approaching our funding agencies. Some of them were the federal government, some were private donors to say, could we use the funding that we currently have to tackle some of the increased and in incredible isolation and harms associated with COVID for incarcerated peoples. And so uh, in the early phases, we were given support under the COVID context to use our funding to start our justice. And what you're seeing here is one of the most stunning items that have come out of the work of the incarcerated people involved in the project. It's a carving of a tree on top of a cedar box. And it's symbolic of the incredible talent and artistry that the incarcerated peoples we've worked with have inspired us to bring to art justice. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kelsey now. Hi again, everyone. So as COVID had us all stuck in our apartments, we were reflecting on how uncomfortable we felt just waiting for things to get quote unquote back to normal. And all the lessons that we learned from the project that Helen just shared about, we decided to fund art justice, art action, reciprocity, transformation and justice. Uh, so what you're seeing here is what we ended up doing with those funds that we redistributed. This is an art kit. Um, we worked with local art galleries and art supply stores to put together a kit. Uh, there is high quality pens and pencils, notebooks, um, envelopes with stamps on them, coloring pencils, and we also worked with some of the elder leaders in our team to put together booklets that offered creative prompts, teachings, messages of, of support, and at the bottom there, those pieces of cloth are Indigenous plant medicines cedar, sweet lavender, or sorry, desert lavender and sage. Uh, we tried to put tobacco in them, but the prisons did not like that. So we had to leave that out, which would normally have been included in the bundles. As I mentioned, we worked with our elders and our team of peer leaders. So folks who have been incarcerated and our artists in the community to put together booklets to share support because we realized that art supplies and a blank page can be really overwhelming during the best case scenario. But when you're isolated in prison alone, having words to help guide you um, could be helpful. So on the left here, there's an image of the front page of a booklet. We worked with one of our elder leaders, Elder Jean Wasowicz to put together some poems and teachings. And she actually shared some of her published poetry and wrote an original poem about how to write a poem to help get the creative juices flowing for folks inside. And then the other image is teachings, prayers, creative and meditative prompts. And we worked with a local artist to put together images of cedar and other plants to try to create a calming and um, beautiful object that folks could hold. So I'm going to share some of the art that has been received to date. Um, at this point, we've distributed about 650 kits across federal prisons in British Columbia. Um, we've also given kits into parole and halfway houses for folks who are out in the community, but still under carceral control. And then as well to isolated Indigenous seniors and other members of the community who are at risk of harm because of the ongoing colonial context in Canada. So with these 650 kits out in the world, we've received about 300 pieces of art. Uh, this is one example of a piece that we received. It is a traditional Northwest Coast painting of a yellow and red sun with a blue, black and red raven holding a pebble in its beak using classic forms of coastal First Nations art such as circles and U-shapes. Um, so this piece was actually done on a poster board using paint materials that were not included in the original kits and really indicative of the immense creativity and wanting to create something outside of the walls and what is given to folks for people in prison and highlighting the passion and commitment from men inside. This is another piece we received. It's from a coloring page um, that was also not included in the kits, but using coloring pencils that were included in the kits. So this is a mosaic of flowers and leaves colored in with pale yellows, greens, and pinks. Correctional staff actually reached out to us uh, when they first received this from an incarcerated man asking if we would quote unquote accept it because it was not an original piece and it 
they weren't sure if what how we were judging different types of art. And we said, of course, we will accept it. And we want to honor all types of creativity and ensure that the project is accessible and welcoming to all. Um, this piece was created by a man at the Regional Treatment Center in British Columbia, which is where you go if you are incarcerated and are suffering from chronic illness or disability. So we're wanting to ensure that there's an inclusivity and accessibility for all types of creativity and hoping that the art kit can provide comfort for folks in all contexts. This is another example of art that we received, two carved wooden canoe paddles and an eagle head done in Northwest Coast First Nation style. Uh, the paddles are about four inches long and the eagle head is roughly the size of a thing of floss. Again, these are items that were not in the kits and we've actually gone and selected things that are mostly using materials not in the kits, but I think it really highlights people's engagement with the project and pushes us to think about what else can be seen in the kits. So we're viewing this as a, a first place to start, but not an end goal. So the kits as an entryway into talking about creativity. And we're also really focused on reciprocity. So from the original study that we did, looking at people creating art and furniture and then gifting it to indigenous communities, we're wanting to create opportunities for connection, not just the creation of art, but the sharing of stories and messages of support and building of community around creativity. So we're in the process of developing a virtual art gallery that will be public facing and also working with corrections to find ways to bring that technology inside to prisons, which is complicated, but something that we're really committed to. We are also working on getting printed art albums that are put into the prison so that the men can hold art albums and flip through and see the work of other folks. We're also partnering with local art galleries across British Columbia and Indigenous libraries and archival services to find other ways to share this work with the world and looking into using things like virtual visitation so that incarcerated men can come virtually to these public art events. And the image here is a virtual gallery space and there's a drawing of a polar bear breaking through the ice and howling at a First Nations moon. So a few things have helped us in this journey. We had a pre-existing network of champions, peer leaders with lived experience of incarceration who we can turn to to tell us what is important and what needs to be done and indigenous elders. We also have a network of community organizations and have been working successfully with federal corrections since 2014. We also have overlapping and flexible-ish pre-existing funding. So we were able to reach out to folks and ask if we can just start buying a whole bunch of art supplies um, we've also been able to purchase laptops and other technology for peers who have been incarcerated so that they can stay connected with us over Zoom during this difficult time. And we've also been able to maintain relationships, realizing that research is more than just outputs. And it's important to have food and gifts and emergency funds for folks who are kind of living and surviving across multiple crises during a pandemic, which is exacerbating inequity. We've also noticed that there's been more attention to the dehumanizing processes of prison during COVID and we're hoping that this increased critical attention will help us to create some long-standing social change about how people in prison are treated and what processes get them there in the first place. Some things have also made this hard of course. Um, while we do have flexible funding it is grant-based and it's unsustainable so we're trying to explore ways to create a sustainable social enterprise and make sure that folks can share their art and be paid for their time. Um, in the long term. Staying connected with folks in prison is also incredibly difficult. There's essentially no technology in Canadian prisons at this point. Um, people send me floppy disks with short stories and poetry on them, so that's where we're at. But it's also an opportunity for advocacy. And we're also advocating to be able to pay people inside for their time, which is currently not possible. Uh, then our partners and the artists and storytellers are getting released out of prison with no access to technology and connectivity and not funding to support them in that. So another opportunity for advocacy. And then underneath all of this is the ongoing colonial context and white supremacy, which is the bricks and mortar of our carceral system, of our prison system, and the fact that prisons are built on purpose to isolate and disconnect. So trying to create connection within those really difficult spaces. And I will turn it over to Helen for the last few slides. Thank you, Kelsey. I just noticed in the chat from Kathy Hay and these stellar creations render me speechless and just really want to um, 
hold my hands high to that comment. I think the original goal of work to give and one of the things that we were really focused on was humanizing people in prison. And so in the Canadian context, sharing the work that is happening in art justice is a way for people to appreciate the artistry and the talent of these men. And many of these men are committed to sharing art for making the world a better place. It, it's beyond the individual benefits. It's about sharing the work. And that's really important to us. Um, and so what our next steps are, um, we're really excited about the idea of tailoring the kit content. So you can hear that people are finding they're inspired by the kits, but then looking elsewhere to curate materials that might exist in, inside the inside the prisons. And so the idea of tailoring to specific contexts, both in community and prisons, we're just moving into the maximum, maximum security facility. And, you know, our sense is that we want to hear from the men about how they want to express their creativity in these different contexts. We want to continue to expand the reciprocity and relationships and mutual healing across community prison sites, which was such a powerful instigator of this work that despite, you know, 500 kilometers or 350 miles between where the men were making and the communities were receiving, they were believing and supporting each other. Um, we know that digital, digital literacy and digital connections are a fundamental human right, and we think it's exceptionally important to start to look at the places and spaces in our world where those human rights are fundamentally violated. And so we're inspired by that ongoing commitment. Um, we're, the, the work post-release is to continue these connections to also offset the harms of people leaving prison, which under COVID are known to intersect with the overdose crisis, uh, social inclusion, social exclusion. We want to support artists to actually move into communities and create opportunities for living wage employment. And at the same time, as we do battle within the institutions to try to honor the men financially for their work. We also see these opportunities to work with the gallery as creating um, artists as employment and skill building through partnerships with the local galleries here in Vancouver. And next slide. So in conclusion, we we think there's a multitude of points of leverage here. And I think I think it must have been um, Amber who said, I love this work. And so, you know, at the days that we think about the barriers that that exist within the federal correctional system to doing this work, we become more and more determined to do it. So champions and never taking no for an answer. One of the things that's been important is as researchers, we sit in this kind of in between space. We're not a programming. We don't do programming and nor are we part of federal corrections. So we have this point of leverage as academics who want to do good in the world. We, Kelsey and I are restless with using research funding that doesn't make a difference in the world. And so we can lobby and do this kind of transformative work as academics through participatory and peer led and elder engaged research. Uh, we know that, that corrections has a dominant culture and yet we're committed to remaking culture. We make culture in every moment of practice, we can transform it and we can hold up the men and hold our hands high to their artistry and connect them with the community and actually tackle some of the major issues within our prison system for indigenous people. Uh, the storytelling component of the project is really exciting. We know that the potential, the therapeutic impact, um, the mental wellness impacts that can arise from being involved in art and storytelling in prisons in particular holds great potential. And so with that, we will um, say thank you to Katie, to Charlie. It's been great to be in the space with Amber and Barbara as well. Um, I think we're, we're, we're reluctant academics, sort of one foot in, one foot in community. And so this feels like such a wonderful space to have joined with all of you today. So thank you. <laughs> wow, Ellen and Kelsey, um, thank you for all of that amazing information. Something that just stuck out to me when you said restless, um, uh, it, it, the idea of being restless in your solidarity with Indigenous folks. And um, it's just amazing what you're doing in British Columbia. And I think we all need to take note <laughs> of your approach. So thank you for being with us today. Um, Kelsey, can you stop sharing your screen um, just so we can all pop back in? And I would invite um, the other presenters to turn their um, videos back on. And we will actually move into our question and answer section as well. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a it's okay. find the stop sharing button. There we go. I did. There we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, for our attendees, uh, or even presenters, if you want to ask each other questions, it's okay to have a, um, a really nice dialogue with each other. Um, you all gave us a lot. I feel like I just overate at a buffet, a really good buffet. <laughs> and um, so for our attendees, um, if you want to ask a question, um, you can use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And you can also um, use the raise your hand feature and we can unmute you and um, let you ask your question directly. Um, so yeah, let's uh, see what people are thinking out there in attendee land. For phone users, um, to toggle between mute and unmute, you would hit star six. And to raise your hand, it would be star nine. Thanks, Katie, for that helpful reminder. I actually have a question for Helen and Kelsey. What, how, you were talking about occupying that space of being academics, but you've in so many ways become advocates and, and allies and everything. Does, I mean, does, you'll still continue being academics, I assume, but like, it feels like your program is growing in like really large ways like when do you when do you ask for <laughs> half time professorship or like what is you know i hope that's not too personal a question but um you i just look at everything that you're doing and like there's no way that this is going to stay contained in a box this big and and what when do you start a nonprofit do you i don't know how that what that process is like in canada but um just wondering what you're thinking next goals as practitioners and academics and, and advocates and allies? I hope that question is okay to ask in this public forum. It's so okay to ask because it's on our mind, especially in the, the last year, we've been really inspired by the writing of Dean Spade who writes about mutual aid. And so like what last summer I was like, I don't wanna be a professor anymore. I wanna do mutual aid, right? So this is exactly, and I think, um, you know, like Kelsey as a doctoral student who's moving into the academic world kind of reluctantly doing a PhD, but also very committed to this work that, you know, as a nurse who went into academia, it was never about, you know, sort of lofty armchair theorizing, right? It was always about, it was always about making a difference somehow in terms of equity and social justice, which has been my sort of um, this, the ground upon which all of nursing work has happened. And then, you know, to realize there's a space within the university that you need to occupy to transform it. I mean, UBC is one of the top tiered Canadian and global universities, needs to do better around community outreach, delivering on tangible changes in the world based on thousands and millions and billions of dollars of research. So we've this idea of one foot in, one foot out is I think exactly what needs to happen. And there's a lot of groundswell at UBC now to to take up action oriented, you know, where advocacy and research actually the line between them is blurred in a good way. Um, but it's challenging. Um, but with commitments to anti indigenous racism and anti racism and decolonizing our colonial institutions, there's a lot of support. So I think COVID, I will never thank COVID for very much, except for the opportunity to say that funding needs to be redirected here and now for this reason. And I think in some ways that's a bit of a push against um, funding agencies to say, we have some ideas about how the money could be used better and not for the call for proposals that you actually submitted. And so. But I, I think that's why being here in this space, like when when Amber was saying, I just love my job, I was like, I would love to do this full time. But, you know, there's graduate students and courses to teach and committees and all the stuff that the university just thrives on. Um, but I, I think this has to be transformative. 
um, in terms of what the university stands for. To decolonize our spaces and places and our students will come, we'll get so many more, I think, students inspired by being in post-secondary education than we would have when we constructed as a place, other, <laughs> another place, but Kelsey may want to add to that. I'm sure she does. Uh, yeah, I just, a, I'm a very reluctant PhD student and I think depending on the day, I have a 20 to 50% confidence that after this, I'm just going to go be a farmer somewhere. But I, um, having originally said I would never do a PhD, because who, who would do that to themselves um, over the course of working with Helen and other mentors at UBC, realizing that research can actually do things. It doesn't have to be this ivory tower thing. And there's a lot of access to funding and privilege. Um, but we have started looking into starting a nonprofit and having a space that people can come and gather and have free food and a rooftop garden and so that's that's not the funding world we live in, um, but something that we're starting to to dip our toes in for sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So many hats, and um, I know Art Reach is going to be following Art Justice to see what you continue to do. Um, we're just excited, and we're glad that you're in our orbit, or our, you know, <laughs> it's a it's a good thing to have you among colleagues. Um, hey, Amber. A question from Emily, if you don't mind. I'm curious to hear more about the Creative Sparks program uh, that you had mentioned during your presentation. Is it, is it, you wanna give a, a little bit more meat sure. to that? Okay. Sure, uh, Creative Spark actually uh, launched, it, like Ruth's Table, it was really trying to bottle up that amazingness of Ruth's Table and make that available to the larger world. So, um, so it also launched when COVID did. So the shift of it sort of changed and became much more about uh, educating professionals about how to be more intentional about arts programming and creativity. And they use the word creative pretty loosely. It's not all specifically about art making, although that's a big part of it. Um, but they do virtual trainings for professionals who are interested in learning more about how to instill creativity into, into everyday programming, more specifically to older adults, but I imagine it's kind of good thought for everybody and good training for everybody. And I put the link in the chat uh, for more information about Creative Spark, and there's a link to contact folks in there as well if you wanna talk to uh, the program team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the chat has become fast and furious, just um, link sharing, <laughs> because everybody's just like gobbling everything up. Um, I'm going to get take a question from our buddy Stephen over at Opera Philadelphia, then I'm going to bounce over because Katie actually, our Katie, has a question um, for Barbara. So um, St uh, Stephen Humes uh, from Opera Philadelphia, how can we st find or stay connected with Art Justice online and or on social media? That is a great question. Uh, we can share our personal Twitter handles and promise to keep in touch with ArtReach to share our public facing website once it's done. We're, we have a draft ready and now we're in the process of working with federal corrections to get their approval to have this art kind of more fulsomely out in the world, fulsomely out in the world. And um, maybe I'll just add, this work is connected to um, it's a research excellence cluster at UBC called Transformative Health and Justice, which is one of those beautiful funded spaces for people to gather and get to know people that are doing work in an academic context, but partnered with communities and with and led by peers and elders. So, um, Stephen, I, I'd love to reach out and, and connect you with this larger uh, group, because I think what's the transformative health and justice cluster is trying to do is to try to transform the space between research, advocacy, programming, mutual aid. There's a lot of interest there. And I think the larger our community, particularly outside of Canada, would be uh, really, really awesome. So thanks, Kelsey. That's so wonderful. Um, and we'll make sure um, that we get you and this is to the attendees, we'll get you people's information and stuff like that um, uh, when we send out our email. What You will be getting a survey that we really, really need you to fill out. Um, it helps us plan for next year's uh, cafes. Um, so be on the lookout for um, that in your email. Katie, you wanna um, 
grab Barbara's attention and ask your question. Yeah, I thought it was really great. Hi, everybody. Um, invisible. Uh, I thought it was really great that um, Kelsey had mentioned sort of the intention of talking about food. And I thought um, maybe Barbara could sort of just touch on the ways in which, especially during the pandemic, but moving forward, reaching out to communities and families through food distribution was such a smart and savvy way to do it. And thinking about sort of moving forward, would this be something that would possibly continue or you know, is the mail system just not as efficient as food distribution? And just thinking about um, how, how key those partnerships were. Sure. Um, yeah, food, food access is a serious um, consideration for a lot of the communities and families that we're serving. And so um, because of our um, relationships and partnerships with the, um, you know, community-based organizations, they have a handle in terms of the pulse of the community. And, um, you know, our, when we entered into this sort of like space, it was really about how does art bring back some social emotional healing? And it's just as important as food access in a way as well. And so we had this collective conversation about, you know, art and food at the same time as people are, you know, making a connection to getting something that's really as important to sustaining our lives. It just seemed like a natural step to connect with the food distribution, um, you know, uh, opportunities that were being made available through the, our partners, but also through the city. Um, you know, the, the city through parks and rec centers were also distributing food where wherever we could sort of find a place where people were gathering to, you know, get these human needs resources addressed, that's where we wanted to be because art is just as essential in feeding the soul. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that, so that was really important to us. Um, and also because we've also, you know, had to pivot some of our programming, we've also emphasized with our conversations with our funders that, um, you know, while our resources may not be used in one direction, can we support food access as well in some of the um, programming that we do that we can distribute maybe some, you know, uh, cards working with local grocers as well in terms of, um, you know, debit cards that our families can use so that they have food access as well. So we've been sort of thinking creatively. And I think as I would sort of sent, mentioned before, we're kind of experimenting a lot in terms of like being responsive and listening to our partner agencies in terms of what they think would be most successful. I, I also just wanna jump onto a point too in terms of like what I heard from from Kelsey and Helen about sustainability and, and, and that sort of like dovetailing between academia and programming, but having been sort of a, um, a nonprofit sort of like uh, person and still am, but just recognizing that the power of the research and the power of the academic sort of like information really helps to inform funders and policymakers where investments need to be made and partnering with community agencies who also have their finger on the pulse to tell you what you know the your constituents or your participants need um, is really helps galvanize I think everybody along the same path in terms of sustainability. I think that's how change happens is collaboration. Thank you, Barbara. I just wanted to add that um, without the evidence, if you will, in the in terms of the impact of work to give that where the pink rocking horse was going up, uh, it would have been very hard to initiate art justice. So I couldn't agree more. I think what what happens all too often is that the findings and evidence don't get translated into the hands of people who make decisions around funding. And so that's another space that I think is really critical for academics to work you know, not just finish the study and carry on to the next, but to actually mobilize those findings into policy arenas so that priorities such as the organizations you're working for are funded, right, under those calls. Yeah. That's a good part of the work, yes. Yeah, just 
jumping onto that, our, our partnership with Puentes de Salud around um, you know, art in terms of early learners and, and their families and strengthening. Um, our funder contracted um, the University of Pittsburgh education team to be an evaluator of the program. And that evaluation and assessment is, is really hard because they have this sort of data lens and sort of, uh, sort of a holistic perspective of not just our program, but their spectrum of grantees in this program to really inform them of some of the strength and what they're finding in the work that we're doing with our communities to be able to guide their investments. I, so you have a lot of power in your pocket to be able to sort of bring that data and that information to the tables because I think funders are really hungry for having you know that sort of information on the ground in terms of like how they can do better in, the, in philanthropy. So many good things <laughs> being said, thank you. Um, I, I, as little things are bubbling up as, as each of you are talking and um, at ArtReach, one of our values, uh, one of the things that we, that we um, really try to embrace is art is a human right. We, you know, we claim that we have stickers <laughs> that say that, um, that we share with people and I'm hearing um, that including healing and um, things. And I, I'm wondering if each of you just wants to take like a minute or two to sort of, as we are coming out of COVID, COVID please God, I hope so. Um, and we start look, looking towards healing. I, I truly believe that um, society is going to be looking towards the arts as part of that healing process and just wondering what um, either your, you individually or your organization is is thinking about taking up you know don't don't give away secrets but things that you've learned that you're going to be carrying into you know the fall and into the winter and spring and saying you know this is this is how we understand healing and the place of the arts you know, because we've all experienced this global pandemic together, how do we help each other heal? Did I, was that too meta of a question? If it was, I can drill down, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna um, pick on Helen first, just because you're right beside me in the Zoom window. That's okay. Yeah, I'm, and I'm gonna invite Kelsey uh, in. I'll just say, we keep writing in our grants, the pandemic and beyond. And so I think we're trying to challenge ourselves to say, what is this beyond space? Um, I, I think in, in work, terms of working with federal corrections, I see COVID has, I think as Kelsey so aptly said, has in our Canadian context, you know, the dehumanization of, of people in prison has never been more apparent in terms of prolonged times in cell, no visitation except for virtual, which is hard, no access to elders. So, you know, if we cannot leverage that this context to sustain these kinds of, in, in, in some ways we've got more public traction, that's not really a word, I don't know what the word is, but um, I think we've got more attention on dehumanization in prisons that COVID has exacerbated, which is going to help us do our work um, in a more powerful way. Prior to COVID, a lot of things were, um, you know, oh, that didn't make the budget this year, we won't be doing that. But with the amount of, you know, 20 for a while in Canada, 23 out of every 24 hours um, of a person in prison's day was spent, you know, isol further isolated in the cell. The surveillance, the, you know, the failure to implement social distancing in, in Canadian prisons. Like, like we hear stories of, oh, go stand one foot from that guy. Ha ha, ha ha, you know, like, so we are going to mine this dehumanization and exacerbated human rights, not to tell a continuing dark story, but to show how important this work is going to be. And I think we're going to have public support for that. So this pandemic and beyond to me, every time we say beyond, it's kind of like, I, it's like, Mwah, like we, we can do this with even more, I think, commitment. Um, Kelsey? Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. Um, one of the peer leaders that we work with, a man who was incarcerated for um, 15 ish years and is a, a beautiful storyteller and advocate. Early on in the pandemic, we had a meeting on Zoom, and his, these words just always stick with me as people were locked down in British Columbia and most of the world. And there was all this concern about the human toll on our mental health of being locked in your apartment, and people were comparing it to prison. And there was, you know, policies were made, and there was all these emergency funds. 
and this peer leader was just reflecting, but we think nothing of doing that to a person for 35 years with no technology, with no door dash, with no ability to go and sit on your patio. So I think hoping that, yeah, COVID and beyond, the art justice was a rapid response to exorbitant mental health harms for people in prison, but those mental health harms are not gonna go away after the pandemic. And as we get back to normal, um, it's really important, I think, for, for our team to just continue to push back against the status quo because it's harmful and it's racist and it's colonial. Um, and storytelling within that context is incredibly powerful. Um, it's changed my life. I had no intention of working with people in prison, but sitting and listening to stories has, it's just, it's changed my life. And I know it's changed many of the lives of the folks that we're working with. So I think from, from the lessons of COVID, great work can be done. Thank you for that, Kelsey. And that, that to echo a little bit, um, we, we are having discussions with um, the disability community to say, what kind of empathy can come out of COVID for people with disabilities, you know, and, and the, the ways in which we as a society, you know, impose isolation and lack of services and lack of right to work from home, you know, like well, this is, this has shown us that people with disabilities who have been asking to work from home should have been able to for years, right? We had, we had the ability and the capabilities, it's just that we didn't, and that's ableist, you know, so I think seeing that parallel track also with, with, with incarceration is, is, is really powerful to think about and, and, and build towards a better future. Um, Amber, can I pick on you next? If you'd like any closing thoughts or anything? Sure. You know, programs like Well Connected and Social Call have been addressing social isolation and loneliness since their inception. And, you know, I, I think pre-COVID, I found myself sort of wanting to shake people to have people understand that this is a real issue. And, you know, it's interesting hearing our justice, right? That was a demographic I hadn't really thought about in, in that capacity. So what COVID has done is really opened up this conversation across every single demographic, because I think that that isolation and that loneliness has affected every single person globally, regardless of anything else. Um, so it's really opened up this conversation. And what has been really fun is seeing how nimble organizations that have historically maybe not been very nimble. I mean, even looking at governmental agencies that are right with so many bureaucracies have been really nimble in, in the way they've adjusted to providing programming and services and funding and all kinds of opportunities I think have, have come from have come from this. And I think everyone just has started tapping into creativity they might have not ever known that they even had. So amen to that, because I think moving forward, we're going to see all these really cool hybrid models of how we did things. And people are thinking about new ways of, of doing things that might have gotten really staid and boring before this. So um, I think, you know, 21, 22 and beyond is just ripe with so many creative opportunities across every single industry. Thank you, Amber. And last but not least, Barbara, any um, <laughs> parting words of wisdom for us? Um, parting words of wisdom. I think I think um, Amber addressed it nicely too, in terms of just that that nimbleness. I think it's really um, this this whole pandemic has moved us in a direction of exploring things that be prior to COVID, we didn't think that we had the capacity to explore. And it's opened up a lot of new ideas and this aha moments in terms of, wow, we can reach and be more accessible than we thought we ever could um, by exploring new models of ways to reach people, both by using technology, but also recognizing that you know, the human interface is just so important. And we recognize that we don't want to lose this in this whole direction around technology, but that we need to think and discover ways to be interactive with each other and still foster those human relationships that help us move forward. And that connection to art, whether it's through a virtual space, but 
to a very tangible space um, is, is just part of, I think, building that sort of civil society of bringing people together and, and feeling whole again. So that's, that's I my love that. I love that. Thank you, Barbara. So good. So good. Um, Okay, so uh, I just want to do some thank yous right away. Um, thank you to Megan from Hands Up Productions for our ASL. <laughs> thank you. Um, and Carrie, uh, who uh, has been behind the curtain and doing the cart captioning. Um, thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. And um, uh, before I put up our closing slide, um, just a reminder, we'll put this up on YouTube. Um, so that if you, you know, want to share with friends or co colleagues or things like that um, who didn't get a chance to make it, you know, we'd love that. Um, you will be getting a survey uh, and we ask you to, to uh, fill that out for us. And because you attended today's cafe session, you will also be put on um, the marketing list for our conference, a virtual conference um, that we're doing in September. It's a three-day conference. And um, I'm going to share that information right now. And we definitely want to thank um, the Independence Public Media Foundation for um, supporting the, all of the accommodations um, today. It was, you know, absolutely wonderful to make sure that we um, are doing what we can to make sure that the disability community is fully involved in what we do and how we do it. Um, so right there, the date, September 21st to the 23rd online, um, registration will open in August. And uh, before we leave, thank you, Helen, Kelsey, Amber, and Barbara for uh, closing out our um, cafe series of 2021. And we look forward to all of the work that you're going to be doing in the future and creating a more just and beautiful world. So thank you and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. This is lovely. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Lovely to meet you all. <laughs>